The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines. If you really want to nail painting, if you really want to get good at it, you've got to get good at composition. And nobody better to teach you than Jim Woodark. I hope you enjoy this video. Hi, my name is Jim Woodark, and I'd like to thank you for buying this video. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm an artist. I've been painting for 20 years in plein air and in the studio. And before that, I had my own cartooning business for 15 years, where I did all sorts of cartooning and designing. Um, I also have three kids. I've been a stay-at-home dad for 20 years and been painting while I take care of those guys. Today, what I'd like to talk about with you is uh, composition and design, whether you're in plein air or you're in the studio. It's how do you compose a strong painting so that your paintings come out better and are easier to look at. We're going to be going over different ways to design a painting, the things I've learned over the years. And we'll also be going over the tools of painting, like value, color, edges, line, shape, things that you can use to strengthen your design once you've composed it. What makes a good painting? How do you design a painting that's strong and keeps your eye engaged? What do professionals do when they paint? So let's look at some different ways to compose. These are um, ways I've found and learned over the years by exploring and reading and just experimenting in my own paintings. So I'd like you to look at these as ideas, not as written in stone. It's always good to explore ideas and see if they work. I, I look at it like um, I'm trying clothes on and I'll take something off the rack and put it on and if it fits, I use it. If it doesn't, you can put it back on the rack. So let's get started on these. So the first uh, design idea I wanted to go over was um, created by a guy named Fibonacci kind of a, an interesting Italian guy in the 11th century. And there's a lot that goes into this, but I don't want to get into that. Basically, I want to see what we can use out of this for our composition and design. But he was interested in designs and in nature. He started noticing and measuring relationships with things, like a, a plant that spirals out and a nautilus shell that spirals out, and measurements of different lengths of bugs and parts and anatomy. So what he started to find out was that there's this ratio that seems to happen in plants and animals, and the ratio was a 1 to 1.618. So basically what this ratio does is that if you would measure like your arm to your hand, you would find that there was a 1.6 ratio from your arm to your wrist, and then this was a 1 from your end of your wrist to your fingers. And he would show that in bugs. If you showed the bug, the end of the bug and the thorax and the head, this ratio here was 1.6 to the head was 1. So that, which is pretty interesting when you start looking at all these things. But how it relates to painting is what we want to look at. So if we were going to look at a rectangular space, he would measure out different sections. And if you did that 1 to 1.6 ratio, you would find that there was points in the canvas 
that seem to have a more pleasing area to put a focal point or uh, subjects that you were painting. A lot of times what you'll see is this is how he uh, would show this example is you would make a square that was a one and then make another square that was a one and then you would make a square that was two and then you would make a square that if you add these two that would make it a square of three and then three and two would be a five And then you would make a square that would be eight. And you can see if your focal point was here, he would design these, if you drew lines like that, you would end up with this spiral shape, which is similar to a nautilus shell or the pattern in a flower, a, a seed flower, or the way a, a, the petals open in a in a flower, and this was a sequence that seemed to happen in nature. And as it relates to painting, you would do this in your canvas. If you put the focal point in this area, and you could have interesting points along this curve, was one way to design it. So if you looked at your canvas, a rectangular shape, you could make a grid pattern at where this point 1.6 to 1 is. So we're right about right there. If you did that this way and that way, and this way and that way, you would have these focal points that you could put your subject matter that you wanted to have your eye look at. So that's one way to design, is to make this grid pattern out of those focal point areas. So here I even found a tool that measures that, that ratio, 1 to 1.6. So this is the 1.6, this is the 1. So if we did that like with my hand, as you can see, the finger that is 1 and this is to the, the, the wrist to the knuckle is 1.6. So you could actually do that in your you know, rectangle space. You could actually do that in your rectangle space. This is the 1.6, and you could do it this way as well. So you could say, if I wanted my focal point here, that'd be a more pleasing spot to put it than right in the center here or right there. It's also a great way to tell, well, I'll put the landscape horizon up here, or if I had it down here, I'll put the landscape horizon here and have a cloud design up here. So the, the Fibonacci sequence is very valuable. It's a little bit hard to carry this around or to redraw this design all the time. So one of the easier ways I found to do this is just to think of a ratio of two to three, which is one of the square designs. Remember this one was two and then this was three. So if you do the oops, two to three ratio in a rectangle and you just mark this off to about five sections and just go twos down here and the same thing here we mark that off to five sections and twos right here so you can get pretty close to the same spot. So that's one way to do it. So here's a, another uh, process that you can use to design. It's a little bit easier than the uh, Fibonacci sequence. And this is called anatomy of a rectangle. And I'm not sure where this came from, but I saw it somewhere and I like it. So what you do is you, you take your rectangle and you design, draw a line in the middle of it, and then you draw two diagonals then you draw each rectangle that that makes, you draw diagonals down from corner to corner. And then you see that there's points here where these intersect, these lines that you just drew intersect, there's actually six points. These four points are very close to the Fibonacci sweet spot, supposedly, in your rectangle. 
So these are areas that you can also put your focal points or your horizon lines, depending on what you want to do. This one's easy to do. It works pretty much every time. And you can do it on any shape canvas that you happen to want to paint on that day. So what I like about this is it gives you multiple areas to put um, subjects or if your main subjects here you can have supporting subjects in those different points. This is one of my favorite ways to to design lately. So another way to design is is using Edgar Payne's uh, composition of outdoor painting designs. I don't know if anybody's read his book or not, but I read it a long time ago and he actually looked at landscape particularly and said there's about nine or ten different designs in landscape. So he classified them into designs such as the steel yard design where you have a tall object on one side and a short object on the other side. He would have another design idea which would be a triangle design such as a mountain where you have a, the mountain here and things that supported it over here. Or he'd have a design called an S composition which could be a river going back And then he had other ones that he talked about, uh, which would be a radiating line design, like if the sun was coming up or you were looking down the tracks at something. He also had an arch tunnel designs that he came up with. So I painted that way for a while. I would look at the composition or the landscape and decide, oh, that's a S composition or that's a steel yard composition. What I didn't like about this is it takes away the creativity in designing. So if you already say, oh, you, you classify it as this, then you don't explore it as much as you would as if you were trying to decide, well, you know, where would I put my focal point? Where am I going to put my supporting characters? It tends to be a little bit more interactive when you don't classify it, but you decide, okay, I'd like to have this here, and my line's going to come over here, and the mountain's coming up this way. And I like those designs where you can place your composition focal points in different areas instead of saying, oh, it's an S composition. Then you stop designing and, inter and thinking about where things are going to be. So basically, you can take some of these elements and or design ideas and combine them together. Like if you wanted to, you like the Edgar Payne thing, well, oh, that's sim you know, an S composition. Well, you can say, I got my design here. It's an S composition, but I'm going to use the anatomy of a rectangle idea. And I'm going to start my river and have it go here. I'm going to have a little house over here, let's say, and some focal point down that way. So you can use both of these as an idea so that you can design the whole canvas with focal points and, and they'll make a stronger painting for you. So the first question you ask is, what are you painting? Why are you painting this scene? What's grabbing your attention? What do you want to say through your paint? And how are you going to say that? What are you going to edit? What are you going to take out? What are you going to leave in? That will best communicate what you're trying to say. How you answer those questions will dictate how your painting comes out and what you will include. So as you can see, I do a lot of sketching. I love to draw. It's one of my favorite things to do. And this is the key to creativity and also design. How are you going to design the scene that you're looking at? And you can change your designs in really quick little thumbnail sketches. So it's a very easy way to figure out different compositions without spending too much time and feeling like you're going to make uh, a big mistake or something. So in this 
demo that I'm going to do, I was in Monument Valley, and it's, it's just an awesome place to go, and I saw this great formation and I took a photo of it. And um, so what I'm doing is trying to figure out how do I want to paint that picture? Do I want to include the whole uh, formation? Does it need to be a nocturne? Because sometimes I like to pretend it's nighttime and paint. Or do I want to do just some of the formation? And how would I design it if I do that? Do I need to include everything that I'm looking at? So that's what all these different compositions are for in the sketchbook. And it helps me figure out which one I think is the most interesting design. Okay, so let's talk about the tools of painting. The first one that I want to talk about is lines. How do you use lines in painting once you've got your design figured out? So uh, you see that oceanscape. This is in beautiful Laguna Beach. And if you look at it, there's certain lines that you can start the composition down with. You got the big cliff rock formation with the surf line. And there's also the horizon line that comes along, is broken up by that rock. And there's a small wave line right here. And that's the pretty much the three lines, major lines that I can see. You can also design or draw around this rock shape because those are some lines. But these lines will help lead your eye into the painting. It'll lead you up this path to a focal point, which is right here. Same with this line, same with that line. There's also a line actually at the base of this cliff that brings that to you. So that's one way that you can design with lines as you're starting to paint. Um, and you can think about that in your design. Also, the thickness of a line can make you pay attention to it more than a thin line. So you can put thicker areas where you want your focal point to go or your eye to go up and lead you into the painting. So the next tool that I want to talk about is values as a tool. So values are your darks and your lights and how can you use that to compose and bring your eye to certain areas. So darks and lights once I was thinking, when I was teaching, you could do the, the uh, tools of painting kind of like the Ten Commandments. So if you talked about it that way, you would say, dark giveth light, or the other way around, light giveth dark. So how you use values in painting is a dark value, such as this nocturne that you're seeing, next to a light value, like the sand is right here, will make you look at it. This dark shape silhouette of that rider against that light sand makes you look at it. So you can use those points to direct your eye in the painting. Here's another dark area. And then this isn't super dark. but it helps to show up that white sand area. So if you use those dark darks and light lights, you can make your eye go around your picture and into the areas that you want to look at. So if you go here, 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 and then up, and hopefully back down again. So the next uh, tool that you can use is called shapes. And the way that works to me is it's the use of big shapes to little shapes.
and that will help direct your eye somewhat. A big shape next to a little shape gets some attention. So if you turned all of these into, into shapes, You can see that this big shape next to some little shapes in descending order kind of makes you want to go look at these shapes down at the end. It's really helpful to look at things in shape design instead of like if this was a bush, if you draw a bush like this, the inside of a bush, it doesn't really help define the shape of it very well. It's better to look at a bush as a shape. There's an outside shape and there's the highlight, like if the sun's hitting it, there's a highlight shape. And there's also the shape that it's interacting with, which might be the sand back here. In designing it that way, you start to have interactions of shapes instead of things, and you'll see the painting as interactions of shapes, which will help you not get into detail too quickly and make an easier design for you. So if you just look at it as a shape design, then you can add the inside of the bush and the highlight. The other thing about shapes is the interaction of shapes, how that shape is designed will make it an interesting shape or a boring shape. So if you make a round bush, it's a fairly boring bush, but if you make it a, a round shape with a little bit more character to it, it becomes a more interesting shape, a more interesting bush. The negative things, or some things that can happen, and happens every time I paint, is I'll be painting along and I'll notice, oh my goodness, look at this, I'll have repetitive shapes, like let's say bushes or something, and, and you tend to repeat the same size shape or the same space in between the shapes. So it's something to watch out for in uh, painting and designing, is to try to make these interesting shapes and different from each other, and also have the spacing between them interesting and different. So another favorite topic, uh, tool of painting is called color. And this is, I think, one of the Achilles heel for many people is they want to jump into color and just start painting because it's so beautiful, which is fine. But all these other things you need to do before color even works is you have to have the right values, you have to have a good design, you have to have all these other tools working as well. But color is very important. <clears throat> and in that uh, Ten Commandments way is gray giveth color is another one of those commandments. I've only come up with about four of them though. And what I mean by gray is Color won't show up as well if everything is colorful. And what I mean by colorful is that the intensity is, is high, uh, high chroma. If the colors are grayed down and then you have a high chroma color, then it shows up. So in the picture that you saw, the nocturne scene, nocturnes, the colors are always subdued, typically. So we have the horse but right behind the horse is an orange light. And because it's a richer color, it's not grayed down as much, that really stands out in this particular picture. Of course, that's an easy one to do because all the rest of the colors in here are very grayed down. They're not straight out of the tube uh, color. But if you were looking at a sunny day, you could do the same thing, is you can gray down the colors except for the where you want to use the focal point or areas where you want to go with your eye. So you can have color in one point and color in another point and color in another point. And that way your eye will go around 
and look around the picture and you can use color to, to make that happen. But it only works, I think, is if you have gray in the, around the picture so that the color shows up more. Another use of color is to do complementary colors. So the Impressionists would do that. They would have one color and next to it they would put the complement of the color, which tends to make a vibration happen when you're looking at it. And that's another way to make your eye go to the focal point. So if I had blue next to this orange window, that would vibrate in a little bit more and make you look at it more. So another thing about color is if you make everything colorful and high chroma, you lose the effectiveness of color. And that goes for all the other tools that we're talking about. If everything is thick paint is another example, you lose the effectiveness of what a glob of thick paint can do. It makes your eye go to it. So in this tool, we're calling it impasto or thick brush work or heavy paint whatever you want to call it. But it's using thick paint as a way to make your eye look at it. So if you have, again, it's the, the opposite of the two of each other, I guess, is you have thick and thin paint. So if you have a very thin paint all over the canvas and all of a sudden you put a big blob of, of paint on the canvas, your eye goes to that because it is raised and it creates a slight shadow and it makes you look at it. Nikolai Fetchin was really good at this, I think. He would put thick paint in his focal points, or no, he would put thick paint all around and then his focal points were more detailed and softer and thinner paints. So he was doing it the other way that I normally do it. So in this painting of the uh, stream, I tried to put thick paint in the sunlit snow banks to make your eye go into the painting. It's just a great way to, to lead your eye. Another way to do it is use the brush strokes in the direction that you want your eye to go. So as you paint, you could move your brush with thick paint and, you, and that brush stroke will stay there and your eye tends to travel down the stroke towards where you want it to go. Ken Oster was really good at, uh, at using those things. So uh, the next tool is called edges and this is a super valuable tool. I love, I love playing with edges and the opposites of each other in edges are hard edges and soft edges. So in this nocturne, we have the horse rider by a fence with bushes. A mesa in the background. And so the, the soft edges will not bring attention to themselves and the hard edges will. And you can see the fence posts and that fence right there has got some real hard edges. The little rifle has hard edges, his hat has a hard edge. But if you soften this bush back here, you soften the line of that mountain, and particularly the line of this mountain back, that recedes those objects and makes you not pay attention to them as much. So you want hard edges to lead your eye around the painting. You could put hard edges at different points. And that makes your eye go in and look at these spots. There's a hard edge down here so that you kind of travel over here. There's a little bit of hard edge underneath the house. And right here as you come down. So you can go around this way. You can come up this way and go around this way. The edges will, will bring attention to them or take attention away. So that's what's really great about edges and something that's super valuable. If anything, try to make a soft edge all over and then try just a really hard edge, as hard edge as you can make, just to see what happens with it. It's a great way to make the eye go around your design. So now we talked about composition, different ways to compose. You can use the Fibonacci, the anatomy of a rectangle, you could use Edgar Payne designs. 
And then we talked about the tools that you can use to strengthen the design. So how, once you have the design, how are you going to lead your eye to that focal point? How are you going to lead your eye around over to this spot, this spot, this spot? And you can use values, edges, color, uh, shapes, and lines. So now we're going to do a demonstration. I'm going to paint this uh, Monument Valley scene and I'll show you how I do that. So let's get started. So I'm going to use the anatomy of a rectangle design idea to compose my thumbnail here, although my thumb's not quite that big. So when I was looking at this scene, I was trying to decide whether I should paint the whole composition or not the whole composition. So in this uh, book of mine, I was sketching out different ideas. I could do the whole composition uh, of the rock formation, which was is, I still might do because I really like that. But then I, I really liked this section onto the right side, and so I was kind of zeroing in on that idea. Should I make it a nocturne? What about that big hill behind it or the, the cliff face behind it? And I started working that out, and I thought about an idea. So I'm going to I'm going to try to do this idea for you here. Okay, so let's get started on the sketch, the thumbnail sketch of the design. I'm looking at the uh, photograph of the monument uh, formation, and I'm going to focus in on the right hand side of that formation because I really like the way it looks. I like the. Uh, Just the sheer size of it, it's incredible when you're, when you're standing there. But I think that if I look at this composition, I want this to be one of my points. Another point is perhaps to have a tree here. Have some bushes leading in this way. And I was looking at that cliff face back here, and I, I don't like that it blocks off. You can't get back here as easily. So I'm going to use my creative license, and I'm going to change that so that, let's say it's just another monument back here, and there's actually a break, and so there's sky back here. I'm going to put a little moon right there and maybe a cloud right like that. See how that works. So what I'm doing is I'm designing and trying to draw out shape formations. So now you can start to see this come together a little bit. These are some bushes here. This is going to be some sand shape. So here is talking about that repetitive size. So I'm going to have to change that if I don't want to uh, make it a boring entryway. So maybe I'll bring this bush over here a little bit more so that this little spit of uh, Sand entrance is a different shape. So if that's sand, this is sand. Now there's different shapes. They're not the same size. So 
in a slightly different, so it helps the entry and look different than it would. Also doing a slight value study as you can do this. My idea is to have the sun's hitting this and it's going into shadow down here. Same thing with back in the, in the background. The, the cliff face back there is already somewhat shadowed. And I like that it does that, pushes that back and brings this forward. Remember when I was talking about values in the tools of painting. So your darkest dark and your lightest lights. If you can try to get those together, that will bring your eye around the painting. Here's the lines of the picture. And that brings your eye around the picture as well. So here's a thumbnail sketch. So I want to I want to look at re, uh, shape relationships to see if there's repetitive shapes like this is similar to that, similar to the similar. So maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I need to move this design around a little bit more. So I don't have that problem. So if I had this a little bit more to the left, it might help. Also, so that's not so significant. I think that's a little bit better. Now, since I already did a marker, you can't really erase it, but you could do this in pencil. You could erase that a little bit, soften it out, and you would start to use hardness of edge to make that go away. But I think that feels pretty good. It might make this a little taller. So the game now is to take this design that I sketched in my thumbnail sketch, and typically I do those smaller, but to make sure that this shape that I am drawing and designing and it's the same shape as the canvas I'm going to paint on. So that's one reason why I made these little marks on the side is I was measuring to make this, I'm going to do a 16 by 20, so I was making sure that this is a 4 to 5 ratio, just like the canvas is. So let's, let's take that and lay out the uh, painting on the board. So now we've done the composition and the sketch and we're going to move on to my painting materials, what I actually use to uh, paint the picture. The first paint I'm squeezing out here is called Flake White, and uh, I used to use Kremnitz White, but they don't make Kremnitz White anymore, and this Flake White is a good uh, substitute for it. It's called Flake White Replacement. And why I use it is it's a great way to mix into a paint to make a bigger volume pile of paint without changing the hue too much. If you did that with titanium white, it, it really changes the value of the, the, the uh, paint and makes it much lighter, whereas the flake white is a little bit more transparent, so it doesn't change the value as much, and you can get a bigger pile of a color that you're trying to, to come up with. And the next one that I'm using is uh, titanium white. Pretty basic. And then I have a manganese blue, which is a warmer blue. It makes a nice um, green, uh, like a spring green. I also have a cool blue, which is ultramarine blue, which I've been using for a long time. It makes colder blues, makes good darks. Then I also have quinacridone red. I used to use alizarin crimson, and that's a cold red, and I like this warmer red that quinacridone is. It seems to, to uh, make nicer colors, uh, warmer colors for me. And then I'm using a cad red light, cadmium red light. And then next to it, I'm going to use Indian yellow. 
it's a very nice tinting yellow or if you're trying to get like a white, a yellow white, it tints it real nice. And then I have a cad yellow medium that I use. And those are my basic paints. I started a long time ago with a, a limited palette and I've added a few colors but it's still fairly limited and I mix, learn how to mix all your colors with these limited paints. So now I laid out my paints and I'd like to talk to you about some of the other tools I use, brushes and palette knives. So this is the first uh, palette knife that I use. It's a, a square-ended flat palette knife and what I like about it is it is great for mixing large volumes of paint. It's great scraping the paint off. You can do some uh, long lines with it, but I use another uh, shaped palette knife for that. Here is my little palette knife. It's, it's a pointed triangular shaped palette knife and I use it basically for uh, making edges, sharp edges if I want to. Uh, it doesn't mix much volume of paint, so it's mostly I use the other one for the, the large paint piles. So I use uh, a combination of brushes depending on how organized I am. I like rosemary brushes, but um, you have to order them from England and sometimes I'm too lazy so I just go down to the art store and, and, and get what I can find. Uh, I use flats. I like to, the feeling of flats. They hold a lot of paint and you can uh, squish them around. They're, they don't pull the paint up as much as a, as a bright brush does. I use uh, two, four, uh, eight, ten sized brushes, depending on the size of the canvas that I'm painting on. So today I'll be using a, a variety of sizes for that. I'm also painting on a Raymar board, which is a linen on uh, masonite, and that's one of my favorite materials. It's a single primed linen. I find that linen, I like the slipperiness of it when you first start out, and then it gets tacky a little later on. It's not as dry as a canvas doesn't seem to suck up the paint as much. And I'm using Gamsol uh, odorless uh, mineral spirits uh, to, to clean the brushes with or use as a medium to thin things out. So those are my materials. Let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tone the canvas with a color. If you just paint on a white canvas, little pieces of the canvas show through because you don't cover everything typically and little pieces of white showing through are very annoying. So I'll tone this canvas typically a complement of, of a color in the painting. So this particular painting has a very warming glow, orange glow to it. So I'm going to do a dirty kind of orange underpainting so that if I miss a spot it'll be a bit of orange showing through. It won't be so distracting. Okay, so here I'm going to come up with a color that I'm going to tone the canvas with. So I'm using cad yellow medium, a little bit of uh, quinacrid in red, a little bit of uh, ultramarine blue, and trying to make a kind of an ochre color. If I put a little bit more red in there, it oranges it up a bit. Now you don't want it to be straight yellow or straight orange, it's too, it's too intense. So by adding a bit of blue, it grays down the tone a bit. I dip it in a uh, rag in my Gamsol. So that it's more of like an ink. and you tone the canvas. I saw somebody doing this with a rag and I, and I used to use a brush and I thought, oh wow, that's so much faster. So I started doing that with a, with a rag and then, uh, let me get the bottom of this. I was toning my canvas in with this rag and I pushed down too hard, or at least I thought it was too hard. And what happened was it pulled up the paint and it's like, oh, wow, look at that. It made an image. 
So it's like I can actually draw that way with this rag. I can lay out my composition, or you can use your finger, but if you use the rag, you can say, okay, here's, if I do my anatomy of a rectangle idea, now I can transfer my design over here. So now that I have this rectangular design on here, I can start pulling up and drawing in my design with this paper towel. When that one doesn't pull up anymore, if it gets too full of paint, you just get another one. Dip it in a little bit. So all I'm concerned about is transferring this design that I did accurately. And that one of the more important things is that it's the correct shape of the design that I had laid out already in my thumbnail sketch. So you can see with this rag, it pulls it out and you can get a value study almost at the same time. And what's so great about this way of designing you can tell in about, I don't know, five, ten minutes, if this is going to work or not. If you want to add some darks back in, you just put the towel into the paint. And then you can draw with it. And it. What's good about this also that I like so much is that you're not getting comp, uh, complicated detail yet. You can't do that very well with a big paper towel wad. All you can do is try to think about basic shapes. So that's really all we're concerned about at the beginning of this is to transfer the shape of things. So to get this design in, make sure that's as tall as you want it. So I'm looking at relationships. Is this feeling like the formation that I want it to feel like? Is it, that was the other thing I was noticing was the mass of the shape. So there's a big shape and then there's little shapes. We we're talking about that in the tools is how you use shape as design to show things to lead your eye. So that feels better now. And when you step back and look at it, it's got the feeling already of the scene that I, I wanted. I put a couple horses here.
You have a tree right there. So I wanted to watch this shape, repetitive shape. You don't want to have the same space here, the same space here, same space there. So I'll just kind of watch that and see what would work better. Tricky, very tricky. It feels a little bit better. All right, so let's take a look and see if this is what we want. I like it, the feeling of it so far, so that's good. Okay, so now that we got that transferred, we're going to go into uh, lines, which would be, I can draw this out and define it more if I want to, and that'll help me know where I'm going. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to draw lines in the, or lines of the shapes define things a little bit more. And I'm just making a, uh, another little pile of that same tone that we had made with the ultramarine and the uh, cad yellow and quinacrid and red design, uh, colors. So I'm going to the shape that I'm doing, it. if you want it to be exactly like what I'm looking at, you can do that. But sometimes what you're given, exactly what you're given, isn't the best design for a painting. Particularly if it's a landscape. You don't have to make it look uh, exactly like it is. If you're doing a portrait, then you have to make it look exactly like it is as best you can. So it's it's kind of uh, a little more challenging, I would say. But since I'm in landscape and it's my painting, I can do whatever the heck I want. And you don't have to exactly do everything that you're given. If it, particularly if it's not helping the design and it doesn't help communicate what you want to say. You know, it's like, do I have to put that other bush back there that's back there? Do I have to put all these other bushes in here that I'm given in the scene? And the, the answer to me is no, I don't. I can use those bushes to communicate and to make your eye go around since they happen to be pretty dark and, and they will bring attention to them. It's important that I place them where I want them to be, not particularly where they're given. So I'm going to have a couple writers here. But what I'm doing right now is just trying to, to uh, lay out shapes so that I have a better map to follow as I'm painting. And I'm also trying to make them interesting, like that tree that's given is kind of a blob of a bush. It really doesn't look very interesting. So I'm trying to make it a little bit more interesting by having a shape that's a better, more dynamic kind of shape. Same thing with bushes. Um, they're fairly boring. Not much you can do for a bush. But we'll try, you know, we'll try to make it a more interesting bush, give it some character, and at least vary the sizes of them as you go in the painting. So the more that you can kind of have an idea of where you're going, the easier it's going to be to paint the picture. If I don't decide things beforehand, then you end up 
being hesitant uh, in your painting, and it shows in the brush strokes. It's, it's more like you're, you're trying to, oh, should I do this or that? And you don't have that confident placement of the paint and just leave it alone. So I'm just making marks to, so I can see where, where I'm going with this. This is going to be interesting if on handling this area here. I don't want to separate this and that as much as it is on the uh, photograph. There's a big shadow right here. If I play this down a little bit, it'll still read as a big mass, I think, and make it a little bit more of a, of a big space instead of this space, this space, this space. So, this is where we're talking about broken edges. If I do that, you still know that there's a crack there, but it certainly doesn't draw your attention to it as with this sharp edge here would. So that's, I think, a nice start with uh, the shapes and the lines, and you can look at the painting and say, okay, how is everything related? Uh, are these working? Is the repetitive shapes that aren't working? Is this enough of a change versus that shape? Are they too much the same? So these questions you can ask before you even get into the, the painting of it, because if I didn't ask those questions and I just started painting and I painted and I painted it, and I ended up with, uh, things that were similar, it's like, well, why isn't this working? It just doesn't look right. And I think that's why, is you, you, it's not planned out enough beforehand. Whenever you're painting, um, it's nice to make piles of gray color so that you can push things in the background without having to mix that whole painting color all over again. Um, a lot of times I'll do that when I'm Painting uh, a picture, I'll use the complementary colors of the scene. So this particular painting, I'm having a blue-gray, or not blue-gray, I'm sorry, orange and blue are my colors that I would call complementary colors in this. So what I'm trying to do is mix a pile of gray paint that's an orange-blue-gray color. An advantage of this is that if you have an object in the foreground, it's going to have more color in it. But as it goes back, it gets bluer and a, a grayer color. The intensity, the value, uh, or the intensity of the hue is going to be less. So that's the value of this gray pile. It's kind of muddy. A lot of times when I'm painting and I paint a picture, I'll scrape up all that extra paint that I mixed up and make a big pile of it. And you put that to the side and you have this pile of, of mud like that. So if you have, let's say, a juniper tree that's very close to you and you come up with this color of the of the tree and there's that color of the tree but then you have other juniper trees that are further back you just add a little bit of this mud to it and it takes the chroma the intensity of the color down a notch or two so that when you compare that one to this one, this one goes back in the distance. So it's a great way for you to uh, 
push things back without having to remix that color, add blue, add white, and, and kill off the intensity of it. Okay, now we're going to get into the painting of the picture uh, using colors and values, uh, edges, thick brush, strokes, thick paint. So all those different things we talked about in the tools of painting. So this one uh, painting is, has a, a big orange-blue combination. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a pile of the gray. So you can actually make several piles of, of gray. You can make a dark one, a light one, depending on how much you want to use it. Like if you had a light pile of gray, then any distant shapes you could dip the color you uh, mixed into that lighter pile of gray and it'll keep it back in the background but it'll reduce the, the intensity of the color so that it fits back there. So that's what I'm doing is making a pile of, of uh, gray with blue and orange as you notice, I'm not using orange, I'm using yellow and red and blue. And there we go. So we'll use that as we paint. So now I'm going to mix up a uh, value of the juniper trees. That's one of my darkest darks, I think, in this painting. So I'm using uh, ultramarine blue and the quinacridone and red, a little bit of the cad yellow medium. And I, I use this flat shaped palette knife to mix these colors. It's such a fast um, way to get a big pile of paint. And what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll put it on here and I don't want it to be thick so you can scrape it down. And that way you, you can get an idea of how dark it's going to be and the color of it without it getting too thick. It's harder to paint over thick paint. And it's easier to to paint over thin paint, so that's another reason why you want it to stay thin. So this is a perfect example of that gray pile use. So here I have this pile of dark that I wanted, but if I make that the same color and value and chroma intensity, then they stay at the same level. I don't really want that. I want them to, go, to push back a little bit. So you just put some gray into that and see if it does that. First I got to scrape off that a little bit. Now it might not show up on the camera, but this is a little bit further back than that. Just because it's grayed out, it's a little lighter in value because that had a little bit of white in it, the, the, the flake white. And I can do the same thing with this tree as well. Add a little bit of blue, a little bit of that gray. And now there are three different levels just with a little bit of that gray, particularly back here, a little bit of the blue. And I'm adding a little bit more blue into this tree because it's closer to this stone. And this is going to be an orangish color, so I want a little more blue in, his, in this so that it vibrates a little bit more because the complements of each other next to each other will vibrate. So I'm going to take that pile and put it over here and hopefully remember what the heck color that was for. But it shouldn't be that hard. Okay, so I stepped back from the painting and I noticed the uh, bad thing I did. 
And this shape and this shape are the same size. So that doesn't work, you know, it makes it kind of boring and repetitive. So the problem is, is this line, the shape I'm making with this line is really separating. What I want is I want this big shape and kind of a smaller shape. So this needs to be a lot less of a line, I think, because then it turns this into a shape of itself and then you have a smaller shape. And that is a little bit more interesting looking than even, even, even. It's one of the things you really have to look out for. Okay, so what I want to do now is let's put some, since this is probably what everybody wants to do, is put in the, the wonderful gold color that that cliff is. Now, if you look at it, it actually has some variations in it, like the top up here, there is a brighter, richer color to me. As it gets down here, it gets a little bit dirtier. Uh, there's fresh parts, if you want to call that, where this rock has uh, fallen off. So. I need to think about that when I'm putting in this the highlight colors is where do I want those fresh parts because you can use them as focal points so if I mix a little bit of that one color and then let's see if we can come up with a little bit of a muddier color, speaking of that, down here. Now also, if the sun is, my idea is that the sun is hitting here and the sun's setting behind me so that the shadow is right here, but as this sunlit section is getting closer to the shadow, it gets a warmer, redder color to it. So I want to see if I can duplicate that feeling. I'm making it a little bit warmer down at the bottom. We're not warmer, I just got it so it would be redder. It's probably not an official artistic term. What I like about doing this with a palette knife is you can get a clean color on the board. Mixing this with a brush tends to keep that color in the brush and you don't get quite that clean feeling to it. Now I'll be painting this but it's nice to do, it's fun to play around with uh, a palette knife sometimes. You get some exciting things that you don't get out of a brush. So that kind of gets that feeling to me. I'm trying to work around the canvas a little bit so that I have things to relate to. So if I have my darkest dark, where's my lightest light going to be? If this is going to be my lightest light, then it would help to put those in so you can relate the whole painting to those darkest darks, lightest lights area. That way you won't put this too dark or that too dark or this too light because then it starts competing with what you want to look at. So let's put in uh, some sky color. So the skies are not blue because they just don't work that color. I was looking, a long time ago, I was looking at, at Edgar Payne paintings. They had a great show uh, at the Pasadena Museum of Art, I think it was. And they had about 50 of his paintings that I was looking at, and it was with a friend of mine. And at that point, the way I painted the color sky was I would use ultramarine blue and white, you know, and if it was too dark, I would just add white to it. 
and I'm looking at, at Edgar Payne's paintings, and his paintings were gray. It was amazing. They were muddy gray paintings, or uh, sky. It's like, why, why would you do that, you know? What would be the value of doing that? And I started to notice that that would, the grayness of the sky wouldn't compete with the highlights that he had on his mountains or rocks or whatever he happened to be painting. Those highlights show up more if the color around them is grayed down. So it was, it was really a, an epiphany, I think is what the word is. It's like, wow, I don't have to paint the sky blue. Even when it, it looks blue, you don't have to paint it blue if it doesn't work with what you're trying to show up. So that's not a bad color. Let's see if I can play with a little bit here. Also, the sky changes. It's not all the same color in this shape of sky. And particularly if the sun's going down, it's going to be different color down here, different value down here than it is going to be up here. At least I find from looking at, at skies a lot is it tends to be a little bit darker here and it gets lighter in value slightly down here. Also, if the sun's going down and the, the shadow is coming across, and if that's in shadow, then you're going to get a sky that has some shadow in it, which tends to make it a purpley color. See if I can get that feeling. So that feels better. But again, it's it's a it's a very grayed down blue. It's certainly not an intense, rich blue. And that'll help me communicate that it's sky, but not compete with what I want to say on this cliff face. So the whole thing, I haven't even touched a brush yet. It's kind of fun to mess around with this. But what I'm trying to do is, is mix. I'm trying to mix colors, and this is the fastest way I've found, and also the easiest way I've found to mix larger piles of color. And there's a certain, I've found that there's a certain speed to painting. Some paint, some speeds work better than others. Go too fast, you end up getting too thick. The paint gets too thick and, and you lose control of it. If you go too slow, you tend to think too much and you lose the spontaneity that you can get. This is particularly outside when you are looking at a scene, it never stays the same. It always is changing. Either the lights come in or going. So I've been noticing that if I can mix the right colors with this palette knife, then I can get into painting. I have less decisions to make in the mixing end of things. So let's take a look at this. Step back and take a look at this. See if that if the relationships are working. Okay, so we got some of that sky in there. And uh, speaking of Edgar Payne, when I was looking at his 
museum show, you'd go up to his painting, and, and I was talking about the sky would have mud in it, or it would be a muddy sky. If he had a blue sky, you'd go up and you'd see orange dots in the sky. It's like, wow, can, you know, what the heck? It really blew my mind, because it's like, well, you can't do that. But I tell you, it is awesome to do. It makes the sky a grayer color, still looks like a blue sky, but it deadens it and pushes it back so that your highlights will show up. I think that we should tackle this foreground because I want to get this dark in so that I can relate it to the color of the cliff a little bit better. So we have bushes at the bottom of this scene. And their um, dark shape isn't quite as as dark as the tree. So this shadow that they're going to have is a different value, a little bit different value, not quite as dark and a different color than uh, the, those junipers. I think they're junipers out there. So I'm going to to make them uh, a little oranger kind of color, a little orange blue shape. They also, what's really neat about this, what I liked about this scene that I took the picture of is that they reflecting some of this glow in them on the highlights. That's really a, a cool effect. So let's see if we can get some of that color in as well. It's a greenish color, but it has orange in it, or at least a, a glow to it. The, the challenge with it is to make it a green orange color, but also to not make it so bright that it starts to look like it's sunlit. So we're trying to get that bush color. Now, to, to me, what I'm going to play with is over here, I'm not going to have them uh, glowing as much because this would reflect down, like if you were, if this was water, it would reflect here, but it's not going to reflect over here. You're going to reflect a, a, a darker thing because it's not reflecting anything bright onto this side. Just the ones that are below the, the hill or the, the monument, I mean, would have a warmer glow to them. Let's see if we can pick that up a bit. It's always good to, especially when you're painting outside, to try to overcompensate for what you think you're seeing. I'm going to add a little bit more orange in there than I think I should need and see what happens. And if you squint, you can tr you can tell the, try to tell see if this value of this is dark enough so that it doesn't if this is in light still that they're not the same they're get, they're going to get pretty close to the same. But you still want that to be slightly darker if I can, or raise the value of this a little bit lighter. Okay, so I'm going to use a brush now and just start. laying in the shapes, the dark shapes. And you can always adjust this color that you made. It doesn't feel like it's dark enough.
try to just get these dark values in for this. This is why the drawing it out really helps. Is you just like, oh, that's where this dark value should go. I use turpentine or the Gamsol to thin the paint out if I want to make a bigger, fill in a bigger space. So as I paint, I'm just trying to think about this lead-in of this path going through here. I'm going to have some riders over here, so I want to have some of that sand come through there. So that looks like it's a trail they're on. And the shape sizes are going to diminish as you go through, as you recede back in the distance. Take a look at that. We need to put some more paint, I think, down. This is where I would try to put that glowing color on top of the bushes. See if I can get that feeling that it's reflecting some of that light that's hitting the big face shape there. So this is where I also want to remember to, to add this pile of gray to my color that I was just mixing. Because if, if I don't, then that same color is going to be back here and, and it won't lie down. It'll just be flat. You need to, even though it's not much of a distance, this needs to be less intense of a color than that is. And it also could be a lighter value than the foreground color. I'm just about out of yellow over there. I need to not be lazy and just keep trying to mix color with that blob. So I'm going to f add some more yellow here. So the great thing about oil paints is it's always easy to change colors or fix mistakes as long as you know what the heck your mistake is. It's really nice to be able to fix it with oil paints. Some other, like watercolors, it's a lot harder to fix a mistake sometimes because you can't recover some of the white area. It's more challenging. So trying to make this bush pattern go back.
So you can kind of get the feeling of it moving backwards. See how it looks over here. When you do a pile of, of this paint with the palette knife mixture, then you have a good amount to work with and you can add to it and change it. You don't have to recreate that same color every time. Just a little bit of a, of a change and it'll push things back. So on this right hand side, I don't have that reflection. So I'm going to try to make it just a little bluer feeling back there. And that it just gives me a way to change and not draw attention as much to this as that. That's got a nice feeling to it. So that's the bush color that we're going to... We'll have to probably go back into this to soften edges. So you want to keep these piles to the side as you paint. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Jim Woodark is one of the hot painters on the Western art scene. His work stands head and shoulders above many artists. But Jim modestly says the key to his success is understanding the principles of great composition. Jim not only studied the greatest composition masters like Edgar Payne, he studied great paintings to find out what they have in common. And he has boiled it all down to a few important composition techniques which, when applied, will make your paintings stand out in a crowd. Discover how to lead the eye through a painting so the path takes the viewer to the places you want them to go. Lividol is proud to bring you Composition for Painters with Jim Woodart, an instructional video that will help you build a foundation for creating higher quality paintings. Not only will Jim reveal his composition secrets, you'll see him do a complete painting from start to finish. He applies his own style to the techniques of value, color, edges, shapes, lines, brushwork, and impasto. While most landscape artists paint exactly what they see, Jim shows you how to strengthen a composition to make the best possible painting. The trick is knowing what to move, where to move it, and how to still keep it looking like nature provided it. Good composition leads to better paintings, and composition for painters with Jim Woodart is a must-see for every landscape painter. Available on DVD or digitally for your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order yours today. Well, that was Composition for Painters with Jim Woodark. If you want to learn more about it, go to lilyartvideo.com. Now it's time to get to know Jim a little bit. Hi, welcome to Interview with Artists. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Plein Air Magazine and Fine Art Connoisseur. Today we're pleased in the studio to have Jim Woodark with us. Jim, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's nice to be here. It's fun watching your career because you've gone through um, what I would consider to be a surge. You've been around for a long time. I've known you for a long time. But a lot of things started happening to you recently. I think uh, about three years ago, you came in maybe second or third in the plein air uh, salon competition and then this recent year you won the national prize you won a fifteen thousand dollar cash yeah. prize and the cover of plein air magazine yeah it was uh, super exciting what was that like for you that was uh, it kind of blew my mind a bit because <laughs> i 
I, a couple of years ago, I won third place, which was really, really thrilling. And uh, then I found out I was in the running this year for some prize that you'd called me and told me to, you know, you're going to be here for something. And so the whole week <laughs> I was thinking, well, what does that mean? You know, you're in the running, you know. So it was just really a, a, a thrilling. And I've been trying to win it, of course, since it started for seven years. I keep entering every year. But to actually hear your name called and, and uh, that you that you were chosen as the winner for, uh, against all those other great paintings was really, really thrilling. We, we often tell people that um, winning a major national competition like that is sometimes a career booster. What, if anything, has happened to your career as a result of that? Well, probably recognition, I think. You get more recognition from just people, and painters particularly, that, that know you. Uh, I, one of the neatest things was when I was walking up and getting on stage, everybody was cheering, which was, I just didn't expect that for some reason, you know, and it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, they, they like me. Kind of <laughs> they thing. like me, they yeah, really right, like me. They really like me. So I think it, it just helped uh, people recognize my artwork. And I, you know, I, I can look and see on my website of how many people are looking at it, and that seems to have increased somewhat gradually over this year. So a combination of winning and being on the cover really was uh, a bonus uh, and getting recognition and, and people admiring your work. So it's just uh, that helped and, and I think it also helps in your own confidence of your work and, and where I was before and where I'm going to. It was a little overwhelming in some spots uh, trying to paint a picture after that because <laughs> it's like, oh, how do you top that now, you know? So uh, I well, try to will. give myself a challenge, you know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with watching your career and watching, you know, you're getting into a lot of important shows. Um, uh, people are paying close attention to what you're doing. And I think that the work you're doing is really phenomenal. It, your, your work, um, though your tendency is to lean a little bit Western, and that's why you wear a hat, I yeah. guess, is because you're a Western kind of guy. But, um, you know, you've got that, that quality down. You've got the quality of the rich Western masters of the past. How did, you, how did you learn that? How did you get to the point where you really could capture that sense of quality? Because there's a difference between a good painter and a great painter, and it's only a 2% difference, but it's enough that it makes the difference in a painting. So what's your process been like to to try and understand how to get to the highest level possible? Well, it, for one, I hadn't uh, tried to focus on my style, like trying to develop a style, because uh, I figured that would just come out of me expressing myself and trying to be the best painter I could be. So mm -hmm. um, that's mostly been the focus, is how do I paint the best painting, I think, I can paint. And I look at lots of different other artists to get inspiration. I look at different ways old masters painted to see what it was that they did that I, of some, some part that I admired from them and try to incorporate it or experiment with it in my work. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've slowly, I used to draw, uh, draw and paint more on the coast because I live in California and I do more ocean scenes and boat scenes. But I, the more I traveled through Utah, uh, going to plein air shows in Sedona or the Grand Canyon or uh, Zion, I just love that area. So just give me a stage brush and I'm happy. So something about that just made me, I just started drifting and, and, and painting more of that subject matter. And then uh, I started adding horses and riders as an element of a story or to show, you know, the size or volume of something. and. Uh, I just like that storytelling a bit. Um, so in the process of doing that and, and just trying to break through whatever level I'm at, what's the next level that would break me through to what I think is a better painting, uh, I kind of came out with this style that I have now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's a master or not. Uh, I always think that mastery is here and I'm here and that there's a gap to 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 paint in to get there. So it, it keeps me kind of pulling forward. Well, I suppose that there, there are levels of mastery, yeah. right? And, and every artist that I know that's worth their weight 
in gold is um, they're always trying to kind of get to the next level. Yeah. You know, in in the Western scene, you know, the, in terms of living painters today, you know, the, probably the very top would be Howard Turpening, yeah. who's getting, you know, a million dollars for his paintings. Uh, that's a tough level to get to, right. but, you know, you're really pushing the limits and, and really edging your way up, and, and uh, certainly I would consider you a master. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, um, and I know I'm certainly better than I was. <laughs> so that's good, you know, but... Uh, I, I always think that it's important to, to me to to feel like there's a place to to grow and to continue growing and getting better at painting. I and think one of the hard things, from my perspective, is how do you know when you've gotten to the next level? I mean, it, were there things that that helped you understand that you needed to be pushing? Did you get to a plateau where you felt maybe you weren't making any progress? How, how, because the hardest thing for all of us as painters is judging what we're doing ourselves. Other people yeah. can see it, but we can't. That's a good question. Uh, and I don't know if I know the answer to it really. Uh, I, of course, sell my paintings to make money, so that's important. And one way I tell if I'm getting better or not is sales increase with the same paintings that I've been doing. You know, So if I can't keep up with the sales, uh, the demand becomes too much oh, something's happened, they see the value for the dollar is really good. And so I raise my prices and, and that slows things down a little bit and then I get better and I sell more. So that's one way to gauge it is in the real world, I guess, money mm -hmm. end of things. Um, and just in my own satisfaction of, of did I paint the subject the way that I wanted it to come out or did it communicate the way I wanted it, did it have that feeling in it? Um, is just kind of my looking at it and feedback from people that I I know my friends I ask them what they think and other artists and and where I'm going, so that's that's a harder one to to tell you know where am I am I stuck or am I breaking through? Uh, a lot of times it's really uh, a little bit of the outside world telling me that something's happening. Uh, because uh, I'm just painting you know trying to do a better painting. Um, so sometimes I can tell myself, sometimes it's the outside world indicates it to me that something's happened. And competitions are a great way. I love to enter in them because it's uh, somebody else judging your work. And that's kind of what uh, art is about anyway. It seems like everybody judges some painters and, and, and then people call them masters because they recognize it. If enough people recognize it, then it sounds like it would be something that's that's true, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, I, th I think people sometimes wonder what the life of an artist is like. Uh, you know, we, we all kind of, before we knew artists or became artists, we kind of lived vicariously through others who, who lived the artist's life. Um, is it all, uh, you know, perfume, perfume and roses or is it, you know, is it a struggle? What, what have you gone through? It's uh it's a hard life in a lot of ways, and it's, and it's uh, I don't know if you could call it hard or whatever. It's, to me, doing something that I don't love to do is hard yeah. to do. And I've had, I had a ton of jobs before I started doing, I started cartooning, my own cartooning business a long time ago. But before I did that, I had all sorts of jobs and I could, I could hardly stand them. It was torture for me, you know. And I realized, you know, what's the difference between doing this job that I can't stand doing or taking the jump and, and the fear and, and going for something I love to do, which is drawing and, or painting. So there's work in, in it, you know. It's certainly not that you just sit there and have it happen. It, there's a lot of effort and energy spent to, to make the picture great. And mm -hmm. there's a whole other part of it trying to make the business go as an artist. So you still have to somehow make money and somehow get your name in front of people so they see your work. So it's not all honey and, and donuts, honey and donuts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what is so gratifying about it is, you know, I'm doing something I love to do and uh, that motivates you to do the things that you don't really want to do, like uh, logistics, you know, or, or uh, marketing things or, or things like that. Well, you know, that, I, th I think that's the big challenge is a lot of us became artists because 
we didn't want to have regular jobs or because we wanted to be creative and yet to make a living as an artist unless you're lucky enough to have uh, a patron who's paying for everything which doesn't happen ever yeah <laughs> uh, maybe it, maybe it did for Rembrandt or something right. but probably not even then and you know even back then is that Rembrandt had to have been a good marketer the most of the artists that we see throughout history that are hanging in the museums who were well collected most of those artists were good marketers yeah and that there are hundreds if not thousands of artists who were probably equally as good as some of the well-known artists who never got noticed and and so from a uh, from from the standpoint of that that decision point you had to say to yourself well I want to be an artist but for me to be an artist I have to sustain it with the business aspects of it was that a hard pill for you to swallow no uh I had my own cartoon business that I started, and uh, part of it was doing uh, cartoon maps of college campuses. Mm -hmm. I'd actually go to campus and I'd draw all the buildings on campus on this big poster board. But I would sell coupon spaces around the edge and make a perforated coupon poster that I'd hand out when school started. So most of that business was cold call advertising sales that I right. did for 15 years. So I got pretty dang good at Cold sure. call advertising sales, right. you know, and managing artists to help me paint or draw the things. So when I wanted to do artwork for a living, it was, you know, of course there's this whole business end and I don't have a problem with that because I've been doing it for the last 15 years of running a business. But if somebody went to art school and they want to do artwork for a living and they never had those experiences of, of selling and, and marketing anything, it would be... Uh, scary I would imagine for them yeah. to do that. So what's your best advice to somebody who who might say okay I want to make the leap from being an amateur or a hobbyist to being a um, you know a professional even if it's a part-time professional what are the things that you think are important for them to understand? Uh, well that it's going to be a lot of work it's not going to be an easy you know thing to do uh, and to, to be clear on if they have a, haven't def, uh, defined a definition of what their vision is for doing art, that if they can be clear on that, then when things are really hard, because things have been really hard sometimes, and you want to quit, and, but that, that why am I here statement helps you look at that, oh, that's why I'm doing this, is because I want to make a difference with my artwork or whatever you know, they came up with. That's a super important uh, statement, I think, because it drives your whole business. And things are going to be hard and things are going to be easy, but when they're hard, you have something to fall back on as far as what you're committed to doing in this business. I was, um, uh, right before I came over here to the studio, I was recording a, a podcast, and I do a marketing minute in the podcast because I teach marketing, of course. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> a lady had, her question was, that she loved doing pastel paintings, but pastel were not being as accepted by the galleries and not as widely appreciated as oil paintings. And should she switch to oil paintings so she could make a better living? And my answer to her was, do what you love, because if you're doing something you don't love, it's not worth doing at all. Yeah, I agree with you. Because <laughs> it's just because I've gone through doing something you don't love and it's so painful that it's not worth the cost on your soul, I don't think, you know. Right. If you're doing something you love, figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. That's the other uh, thing I would tell somebody is like, do what you love you, and you got to do it full out. And it's going to be easy sometimes, it's going to be real hard sometimes. So if you can't s figure out how to sell it as well as oils, we'll figure out a way how to sell it, you right. know. It's there, you just have to f figure it out. So somehow, but uh, it's not going to, it's going to be easy. You right. know, maybe you have to do 10 times more paintings or drawings or whatever they call pastels than an, one person doing one painting in oils to make right. the same amount of money. But at least you're doing what you want to do. Right. So I think that's, that's really critically important. So help everybody understand a, a little bit about you personally. What's something that you know, we see you at shows or we see stories about you in the magazines and, and you're this prominent artist, but 
What, what's home like for you? Well, I, got, I have three kids. Uh, I had a son, uh, and then we had twin girls. So I was a stay-at-home dad. That's what I did. Because uh, when I was doing my business and my wife got pregnant, it's like, okay, who's going to take care of the kid? And she made more money than I did, and she had health insurance. <laughs> so it's like, oh, man. So I stayed home, uh, and then we had twins, and I did that. And I would paint uh, three days a week and put them in daycare three days a week so I could keep my sanity and some sort of career, you know. Yeah. But that was that was like if I was going to say the other work that I've done is that's is being the stay-at-home dad and uh, sure that's the best work you can get. Oh, it's awesome! And come to find out, I was perfect for it. You know, it was, it was I loved doing it. I loved. It seemed like I had the right personality for it, and it, it seemed like the kids came out not too bothered. <laughs> <laughs> but now they're twenty, and the, he, my son's twenty, and the girls are eighteen. So it's it's uh, really thrilling. Anybody following interest in art? Well, one of the twins uh, is very creative uh, in drawing. She can draw people without any training at all. It's amazing. And she's also very creative with uh, fashion and jewelry. And I mean, she's like this creative button. You and know. what are the other two into? My other, my son is uh, trying to be a uh, construction management engineer, mm -hmm. and he's super athletic, so he got that athletic part of me. Um, and uh, my other, the other twin is very musical. She is incredibly good at memorizing and picks up on music. I think that's how she should learn. You know, if she ever needs to learn anything, just turn it to a song and she'll be <laughs> perfect at it. So they're, they're you know, different kids, uh, even though the twins are, the, are twins, they still are completely different personalities. Sure. But, that's that's uh, some of my home life, and my wife's a, a high school French teacher, mm -hmm. so uh, we're both at the point where we we're trying to kick the kids out of the house, and 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 she wants to retire, and and now they're all in college, so it's like oh, just a few more years. Well, retirement's <laughs> not in the cards for you because really, what you do, you can kind of do it forever. Right. Well, yeah. If I retired, I'd be painting. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't. I don't see myself stopping. I don't see any reason to, unless I just don't want to do it anymore. So, we'll see how that goes. So, what is the best advice if somebody is, let's say, somebody's watching this and they're just kind of starting painting and and they want to get really good? We we all have these really bad experiences early on when we start painting, and sometimes along the path, uh, you know, everybody. Everybody from the top painters that I know have all done bad paintings, and some of them still do from time to yeah. time. Uh, do you ever have dogs? Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I can recognize them most of the time about halfway through, and I just scrape them off, you know, so yeah. you don't get, you know, bothered by that thing, having to look at it all, all the time. So you just, if you see, uh, let's say you don't catch yourself and you just finish painting it, and it just is a horrible painting, the best thing is to just throw it away. I mean, that way you don't have to be reminded of it for one, but the, you do learn a lot from it too. Right. That's the other thing. First, learn what did, what went wrong and why did it go wrong, right. so that you can not have that happen in the future. And then I just throw the ones that, that are, are bad paintings out. Because don't, don't get too invested in your work. Yeah, and then just paint a lot. I mean, anybody who's starting out, you need to, I, I draw, I love to draw and I would, it's the key, I think, to creativity and to design and to progress. But most people don't do that. They don't. They just want to get into color. I want to paint, you know, the color because it's so much fun, you know. And I a lot of times they say it's like baking a cake. If you don't bake the cake part, you can't put the icing on top. And everybody mm. thinks, well, I want to do the icing because that's the fun part and it tastes <laughs> sweet and all that. Well, the cake is the drawing and the drawing and the drawing and the drawing and then the practice of trying a painting over and over and over and over again and failing and failing and failing. So that's just part of it, you know. It's, I got a guitar just recently, uh, I think it last year, my daughter was in guitar and so I thought, I'd, you know, I always want to learn. So I got one and I started playing around with it and I could do some chords and I go, oh, I know this. I'm going to have to sit here and practice every day for a year and I might be able to play one song. <laughs> it's just like painting, you know, so you got to go out and you got to draw and paint every day and you'll know, get better, but you're not going to get that much better. And it just takes a lot of work. 
in yeah. practice. And yeah. if you love doing it, it doesn't feel like work, but that's, you know, a lot of energy, I guess, would be a better word. We did a video on, of, with Brian Mark Taylor, which was called The Master's Mind, and it was on chunk learning. And the idea, using your guitar analogy, is that you would learn to play one note, and then you learn, you get it to the point where you could play that one note really well, play it over and over again, very slowly. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, add the second note, and you practice that very slowly, and then you speed it up, speed it up, then you add the two together, and then you get good at that, you know, going from one to the other, and then you add the third one. And he says the same thing really applies in learning, is that, for instance, rather than trying to learn the whole, take a piece of the whole, you know, let's yeah. say if you're painting a face, then focus on just practicing painting the nose, or in fact, focus on painting the bridge of the nose, or the nostrils or something, and then add that, and then add the next piece, so that, and, and your mind actually absorbs things faster that way. Wow, that's a great, so I should get that video. My, my, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you, you have friends in high places, maybe yeah, we yeah, can yeah. get one of those. <laughs> I like it. And so, best advice is draw all the time, then what? Learn your values? Would, what, what, what would the steps be? I'd say that the, the drawing is uh, important because you design that way. You put, where's this gonna go? Where's that bush gonna go? How close to the top am I gonna make the mountains? Where am I gonna put the focal point? And, and that can be done in these little thumbnails. And if you don't like that one, make another one. And it's, it's, a, it's not much time invested in it, but it's a, a better thought process. And do you do a thumbnail before every painting? Yeah. So a thumbnail least, is a small sketch. At least one thumbnail before every painting. Right. Sometimes it's better to do two or three because you might not have had that thought the first go around looking yeah. at a scene. And then the fourth thought is a much better, different, uh, composition, more interesting composition than the, than the trite, you know, straight on thought you had the first time. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's what I would do first. And then I think values are probably the second, or, or in painting, it, they're probably the most important part of, of painting. So for, after the, the design. for the people out there who don't know what values are, maybe they're just kind of learning, can you articulate what that yeah, is? Yeah, values really refer to darks and lights. So it's, they have a scale of, you know, like if zero is black and 10 is white, you have a gradation of from dark to light. So the value scale, that's what the value scale is. So when you're outside painting, if you're looking at a scene and you all of a sudden turn it into a black and white photograph, you could see, oh, there's the darkest dark and here's the lightest light. and if you can get those values correct when you're using color, it will make the painting read better. Even when you're not using color. Right, just in black, if you just painted right. the picture in black and white, it would be actually a great uh, lesson because you start to, to relate to painting and scenes as values. And uh, whenever people start painting, their values are always uh, very close together. In other words, there's not much range between their darkest dark and their lightest light. So their paintings tend to be flat and kind of uh, not much pop to them. When you're looking for a scene, uh, do you walk out and look at that scene and say, the values are too close, this isn't the right day, or the sun isn't right, um, or because you know, you're, you're looking for a minimum of how many values? Three values, I would think, at, at least. Yeah, I guess. Dark, medium, and light. Yeah. To me, it's, I, I was thinking about that before I did a lot of these videos that I worked on, was what inspires me when I'm out in a scene, you know? And I used to think it was atmosphere, the, the, the feeling of, of between subjects, but I think really it's light, the way light plays on something. So it can be a very close value day as long as it's an, the light's hitting something interestingly it makes it more interesting to paint. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, three values is, is a good thing to have, a, you know, at least a dark, a medium, and a light. They can be close together, but as long as there's about three of them, that's a good start. So how important is plein air painting? Uh, it, the idea of getting outdoors and painting, and how does it change your ability to paint? Um, I think it's very important because you learn so much from it. Um, you learn how light affects objects. 
and you learn how light or color looks in light, how color looks in shadow, and it's just uh, it's a great education. So that's one reason why I love doing it. Plus, you get to go to places that are beautiful places, you know. So that's that doesn't it, hurt. Yeah, it's so inspiring. It's like you know, I live in Southern California, so there's some beautiful places there, but there's also a lot, a lot of people. So. Um, if you go to the ocean, it's it's gorgeous place to paint, and it's right there in front of you, and you can get so much more information out of the scene from your eyes than you do from a photograph you took, and trying to recreate that back in the studio. You miss all the other senses that you're you're getting hit with when you're out on location. Sure, there's all that smell of the ocean. There's the sun on your face. And there's the wind. There's the biting flies. So Jim, how soon is too soon? Uh, somebody who's beginning painting, is it best for them to get comfortable with painting first before they try to go outdoors, trying it from photographs? What's your recommendation? Well, it, to me, it's uh, like you're trying to learn how to drive a car, as you don't just get in the car and take off because you're gonna crash. So you do need to know how the you know stick shift works, if you have a stick shift, how the clutch works, how the drive, how to signal, all the things that a car does before you take it on a trip. And painting's the same way. As you, it would help to know how the medium works that you're gonna paint in, if it's oils. You know, what happens when you paint thick paint? How do you get paint on top of thick paint? What does it do when you we paint on the canvas and you accidentally go into a, another section that's already painted? So things like that would be valuable to know. So you could experiment with those things uh, in a studio setting. Mm -hmm. um, and then having the right equipment is super important when you go outside. If you have equipment that is not set up for uh, plein air painting, it's, it's like skiing with Levi's on. <laughs> you freeze to death and it's no fun, you know? So uh, you have to have equipment that doesn't blow over, doesn't fall apart, not making you sit on the ground. Like when I first started plein air painting, I was doing watercolors and I just had a watercolor board and I sat on the ground and tried to paint. I remember trying to paint a saguaro in the, in the swash and I got my back sunburned and my back was killing me and <laughs> it came out horrible. But you know, it's stuff you learn. Yeah. So uh, there's some things that I would, you know, say don't do that, you know, because it's just no fun. Uh, so you want it to be somewhat enjoyable. So knowing a little bit about how your medium works and then having equipment that works for plein air painting would, would help to get started out there. But the sooner the better because it's inspiring. That's the, the and you get to make friends uh, with yeah. the people that you paint with. Yeah, it's, it's very social. It can be a lot of fun. Yeah. And you're outdoors and uh, it can be frustrating, yeah, but uh, certainly worth it. And, and also, you're going to see color and light differently the minute you start doing that. Yeah, photographs never really properly represent color and light. It 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 actually you you it happens to you. I remember driving, and I'd been painting outside for a little bit, and I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at the mountains and going, "Oh my God, look at all the color there!" Almost ran a red light, but it was it was distinctions that you hadn't seen before. You know, because if you were practicing your eye to start to notice different things that you wouldn't have seen before, you just call that gray. And now it's like, oh, wait, that's not gray. That's like a, a blue brown over here and an a olive greenish kind of color over there. So you, you do learn a lot and you see more when you start doing it. One thing I've noticed about your painting is that you're the master of shadow. And what I mean by that is a lot of your paintings seem to be of very dramatic darks and lights. You've got a, a, a large, oftentimes a large foreground in the shadow. You're also fabulous at doing nocturne paintings, which are really almost all shadow with muted light. Um, and, and I think that as, as a painter, I think that's one of the hardest possible things to know how to do because you know, you're, you're trying to show the, the detail and the light in the shadow and, and then create this contrast where you can really get the sense of the sun really blasting on the side of the building or something. Yeah. How do you do that? That's uh, uh, knowing how grays work is, I think, the best answer for that. Is there's there's the color that comes straight out of the tube, 
And then there's like, well, if that color is in sunshine, it's probably going to look like that. It's going to be rich and bright. Give me an example of a color, a yellow. But like if you had a lemon in the sun, yeah. the, the sunlit part of the lemon is going to be this wonderful yellow that's kind of more straight out of the, the lemon color tube thing, you know. But when it turns that corner and gets into the shadow part, what in the heck color is that? And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what people struggle with. I used to just add, what did I used to do? I used to add orange to yellow because, oh, that, that sounds like it would be a shadow side to yellow. But that was adding orange to yellow, which makes a yellow orange, not the shadow side of yellow. And the best uh, example or thing that I learned from was I was turned on to the color wheel. <laughs> you think that I would have known something about this, but I never did. And uh, this uh, company, Gamblin Oil Paints, if you go, I think, on their website, they have a video somewhere, and it's a three-dimensional color I've seen wheel. It. It's, it's fabulous. brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant, because they go inside of this three-dimensional blobs of paint, and you see that, oh, on this side's blue, and this side's orange, or yellow and purple, and if you add just a little bit of purple to yellow, it makes a slight shadowed yellow. And it, it works beautifully if you ever do that. So that was, I think, the main thing uh, that I did is start experimenting with that idea. Um, is adding the complement of the color that I'm trying to make. And it felt like a shadow color. And also the other thing is that the shadows of color are warmer than the lit part of that same color, which was something Ken Oster said in one of his workshops. And I was like, what are you talking about? If it's in the light, it's got to be warmer than in the shadow. But that's because we're thinking, oh, the sun is warm. You know, when it, when it touches your face, it's warm. Right. But if you took like blue, or let's say we took yellow, and you put it, and you had to paint it in the light, typically you add a little bit of white to that. And white always cools down a color. So the shadow would not have white in it, and it would be a warmer color of that same color. But that was always hard to understand for me, and still a little bit screwy sounded. <laughs> but I think that the one that made the most difference was the complement uh, in the shadow spot, and that seems to start playing around with it. And the other thing the is complement just... Complement meaning the opposite. The opposite on right, the so, color wheel. Yeah, so everybody... You should explain that because there may be people that understand. Yeah, understood. sorry. Um, yeah, there's a color wheel has uh, yellow and uh, what are the three? The blue, and yellow, red. and red. Right. And so supposedly the complement of those colors is on the opposite of the color wheel. Yellow and blue make a green. That's the complement of red. And uh, yellow and red make orange. That's the complement of blue. So they're, they're the opposite spectrums. And if you take those colors and you mix them together, if you mix the equal parts of them together, they'd have a grayed down mixture that was green blue, or I mean orange blue, or yellow purple. And that's what the, the color wheel is, is, is how to mix colors right. off of these primary colors. Right. Uh, and that is the thing that you can study. Uh, Richard Schmidt has a great, uh, exercise in his a la prima book where you take your palette whatever palette colors that you use and you make these charts of these little inch squares and you take like cad yellow medium which is i use and you fill the first square with that then you add a little bit of white a little bit more white so you do a gradation and then you take that same color and mix it with the color right next to it in that first square a little bit of white and you do this with your whole thing your whole palette so you get all the combinations possible you have these charts and they, what happens after they get through the primary color that they are, when they start getting mixed with the other colors on the palette, you see all the different colored grays that you would see in a scene. So it's like if you look at a scene, and you can take out this green kind of color chart. It's like, oh, look at that's these greens right in here. And you can see how to mix them. So that's a, I never did that, but it's a great exercise. You, you can always tell a mature painter by the quality of their grays. Yeah. And the assumption is, I think when we all start painting, the assumption is that a colorful painting has a lot of color on it. Um, but I've found it to be the opposite to be true, that a colorful painting has a lot of grays on it and a little bit of punch of color, but yeah. it makes the whole thing feel colorful. Yeah, it's one of the 
Ten Commandments of Painting that I'm still trying to get ten. Oh, okay, how many do you have and what I, are I they? think four of them, I think, or something like But gray giveth, if you wanted to talk like Moses, okay. gray giveth color, you know, because the color is great, but it doesn't show up if everything's the same richness of color. So the grays of something, and then a punch of higher chroma or more pure color, then it jumps out at you. Uh, but without those grays around it, if you had you know, punch of this color, punch of that color, punch of, you lose the effectiveness of grays and then it doesn't seem as colorful. And I think it's uh, maybe like water in a desert, you know, it's like since there's so much desert, that little bit of water is really precious. <laughs> and so the same thing with, with grays, you, you know. You think like a cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I um, have encountered a lot of very, very important and very brilliant artists who are still using the color charts. Uh, you know, go through that process, and they they now are to the point where they keep the color charts charts by their easels, and then they're able to go and say, okay, that's the color, and, and it of course shows you exactly how to mix it because right. it's there. But you'd be surprised at some of the names that I've encountered who are still doing it and and consider it an important exercise. Yeah. So, do you have any other commandments? Uh, dark giveth light. Uh, yeah. Hard. You want to explain that one? Yes, that pertains to values. So it could be the other way, light giveth dark or whatever you want to talk about it. But um, you can use, those are all tools that you can use to direct your eye around a painting. So uh, once you've composed it, like this is where I want the focal point, and I'm going to have a tree over here in the path this way, you can say, okay, if, if in my focal point I have the darkest dark and the lightest light, that's going to create a place to look because that makes you look at something. So um, if you're doing uh, uh, like this scene that I, I just did where the foreground's in shadow and then the building's got light on it, that dark will make the light show up. And one of the things I was working on in this is I had this yellow light hitting the side of the building and you're looking at it, it's like, well, should I put it, should I make it richer, you know, more straight from the kind of tube color and one of the things I said well it's not really because if I work on the dark areas it's going to make that show up as a lighter area if this is too close in value to the light then it won't look like it's bright but if this darkens up it all of a sudden that looks a lot lighter so, so dark next to light makes light feel brighter the right. darker it is next right or if you have a, a very high key painting and you put a dark spot, your eye goes right to it. Right. You can't help it because it's always odd, you know, compared to what it's around it. So, okay. any other commandments? Uh, hard give us so uh, soft, give us hard. <laughs> That's with edges. A lot of times, people will paint a picture, and everything's a very hard-edged painting. Very sharp, yeah. Yeah, and so you lose the effectiveness of what a hard edge will do. So if you have a a soft painting where everything you soften the edges with the soft little brush and everything's kind of fuzzy and all of a sudden you put a hard edge shape next to another one your eye goes to that area so, so it's 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 a contrast principle just like dark to light yeah it's that sharpness that creates a more contrasty yeah feel. and thin and thick is another one um, thick paint is a great way to get your eye attracted to something and some people think, well, Impressionism it was all thick, 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 which it, a lot of it was. But uh, if you want to use thick as a tool, then you put it where it's thin around it so that it stands out as, uh, and it makes your eye look at it. So now, to, now, you mentioned Richard Schmidt earlier. Schmidt always talks about keeping shadows transparent. Uh, in, in so I would assume the opposite of keeping shadows transparent is keeping the lights opaque, maybe opaque yeah. and thick. And the reason why is once you add white to something, it, it loses its transparency anyway. So that, the, the two kind of work together that, that way. Um, but that, anything, it's, all of it seems to be one extreme or the other. You know? So with thick and thin paint, there was some other, oh, shapes was another thing that, that you can use as, as ways to direct your eye. If you have a big shape here and then you have little shapes over here, your eye tends to go to where the little shapes are because they're kind of detailed. So you can think of that when you're designing, is keeping shapes bigger and less 
broken up and mm -hmm. until you want them to be in a focal point. Mm -hmm. So you're also a master of composition. You didn't know that, did you? The hell, I'm I learning it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, uh, you know, there are a lot of composition tips or tricks or techniques that a lot of people use. For instance, some people will take, you know, kind of take the tic-tac-toe board on the painting and, and the points where the lines intersect are places where it makes for great um, focal points. You know, when we were all in elementary school, we always put the, the center of focus right in the middle of the paper, which is typically the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Do you have any particular uh, principles that you try to employ in composition? Well, it's, that's one of them, kind of, is where you, you used to kind of cut it up into thirds, you know, and those points are where you're suggested to put those. Uh, earlier in my career, I read Edgar Payne's book about composition of outdoor painting. Fabulous he, book. Yeah, neat book and such a great painter. And you look at his, he classified them into like 12 different designs. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a while. It's like, oh, what is this? Oh, that's an S composition, or this is a steel yard composition. And that works pretty good. But what I didn't like about it is, it, is I had, once I, I kind of had classified it. So I didn't explore the composition the same way as if I don't think of it as a pre-classified design. I'm just looking at it and saying, well, where do I want to place things? And I've, I've looked into different compositional techniques, like there's this thing called Fibonacci sequence, mm -hmm. which is, is a pattern that is repeated in nature and in the shapes of things and the length of things. And this, how it relates to painting is, this guy makes kind of a Nautilus shell uh, design, but you can put your focal point in this ratio of about 0.6 to one. If you go through all the numbers, eventually it comes out to be 0.6 something to one, and if you can make lines like that, and it makes a grid. It's not quite thirds, so it makes a little bit off the third, third, third line. And that's that's what I use that one. And there's another one I use called Anatomy of a Rectangle, where it's, it's a similar thing where you take a rectangle, you cut a line in half, you draw diagonals, and then you draw diagonals in those little rectangles. And where those lines intersect are supposed points that are make it more interesting to put your focal point. But I still like to try to do more of an organic design with it. It's like, okay, I'm going to place my focal point at one of these spots. And how am I going to do the rest of this? You know, where do I place other sub uh, focal points that would support this main one? And I put those maybe in those places and tr figure out horizon lines and stuff like that. So I use all of those techniques. You, you, know. give, uh, you give people permission to move mountains and trees. Yeah. In fact, that's, it's essential. And mo most people, when you start out, nobody does that because they're just trying to paint the thing. <laughs> you right. know, they're just trying to still be able to represent a tree and make it look like a tree. So they're looking at the tree, they're trying to paint the tree, they're looking at the tree, trying to paint the tree. And where it happens to be is exactly where they're going to put it because they're just trying to paint it. Uh, but the better you get, uh, you start to realize, well, that's a really boring pla painting because what nature gives you a lot of times isn't the best composition for a painting. It's, it's beautiful, but you don't have to put that tree there if it's going to detract from other things. Or if it's a great tree and you want it to be the, the center of interest, well, move it over to the center of interest. I think you told me you were in, a, in an event some, somewhere and uh, someone was critical of you because you added a figure that wasn't there or yeah. put a put a mountain in that wasn't there or something like that. Yeah, you get flack for it. <laughs> but, but that's okay. I it, mean, your, your is. goal is to make an interesting and compelling painting, yeah. not, to, not to do a photographic copy of something. Right, I mean, I would just take a photograph if I wanted to do that. And to me, my whole goal is to paint the best painting I can do, what I think is the most interesting painting. So I don't care whether I do it in the studio or I paint it on location, if I add something or I, I move things around. Unless it's, it's uh, you're painting in a plein air competition and it's purely plein air, but even then it's a can of worms because you can go up to somebody's painting and say, well, where's that leaf that's on the ground right there? It's not in your painting, you, you omitted it, you know? So that's kind of silly, I think, in a, in a way, but it really to me is, is what's the best painting? You know, what, what, what gets you to the best painting that you can paint? Yeah. And, uh, 
whatever way that is, is the way that works. Final words of advice for anybody who might be watching this and aspiring to be a painter like you are. Um, if you want to do it, then I think you should do it. You know, you go for your dream, whatever that happens to be, and uh, just do it every day. That's, that's the game. That's great. Well, Jim, thank you for being here, and it's been a pleasure getting to know you, and, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, this has been Interviews with Artists. I'm Eric Rhodes, and our guest was Jim Woodark. Thanks for your time today. That was Jim Woodark and Composition for Painters, and composition is so very important. You can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes. Jim Woodark is one of the hot painters on the Western art scene. His work stands head and shoulders above many artists. But Jim modestly says the key to his success is understanding the principles of great composition. Jim not only studied the greatest composition masters like Edgar Payne, he studied great paintings to find out what they have in common. And he has boiled it all down to a few important composition techniques which, when applied, will make your paintings stand out in a crowd. Discover how to lead the eye through a painting so the path takes the viewer to the places you want them to go. Lividal is proud to bring you Composition for Painters with Jim Woodark, an instructional video that will help you build a foundation for creating higher quality paintings. Not only will Jim reveal his composition secrets, you'll see him do a complete painting from start to finish. He applies his own style to the techniques of value, color, edges, shapes, lines, brushwork, and impasto. While most landscape artists paint exactly what they see, Jim shows you how to strengthen a composition to make the best possible painting. The trick is knowing what to move, where to move it, and how to still keep it looking like nature provided it. Good composition leads to better paintings, and Composition for Painters with Jim Woodart is a must-see for every landscape painter. Available on DVD or digitally for your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order yours today.